Hi, and welcome to the Scottish Greens podcast. I'm Lorna Slater, one of the co-leaders. And I'm Gillian Mackay, lead candidate for Central Scotland. Thank you so much for joining us, Gillian. I am loving the hair. <laughs> Thank you. It's just wash in, wash out, so it will eventually fade. But seeing as it was um, May the 4th yesterday and all that sort of jazz, I thought I was going to attempt to, to get to get it the same colour as Sabine Wren's hair. That did not work. It went far more green than blue. So <laughs> we're just having to hope it fades quickly or take a bottle of Ozine to it, one of the two. You could just do more, like buy two more tubes and really go for it. <laughs> I had a I had a video call with um with Andy and the rest of our office team yesterday and I think Andy was grateful when he heard it washed out quickly. <laughs> he was a bit surprised by it, I think. I love it. I think it looks fantastic. So we've had lots of chat on this podcast about lockdown hair and how pe yeah. some people are like, I'm just going wild. Mine's just going crazy. Some people have just shaved off, like, um, as Red said on the other podcast, just burn it to the ground, start over. <laughs> and the color is good. So Cami, our colleague um, from, is it, uh, from West Lothian, he's done his yep. uh, bright purple. Alan Folds is blue at the moment as well. Um so I think everybody's been at the box die. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? It's so it's <laughs> now I'm I'm kind of tempted, I don't know, I'm a bit chicken really, I think. <laughs> wash in, wash out. That's the way forward. That's the thing. My hair is so pale, it takes the colour really well. So I have done it for parties and stuff like a long time ago. <laughs> Back when I used to go to parties, Gillian. <laughs> <laughs> Party stuff doesn't count uh, as a party. Yeah, somehow I've yeah lost <laughs> lost the sort of other definition of party. Anyway, so you mentioned there that uh, you work in the Scottish Parliament. So you work for Andy Whiteman, one of our MSPs. Um, now I think we're all very interested to know because I know this is every day for you. But for those of us who aren't parliamentarians and who don't visit or work in the Parliament what do you guys do? So tell us about what it's like to work in the parliament and particularly I'm interested in knowing, well, what, what does normal life look like? And then how has that been different since the COVID crisis? Normal life is, is um, support very much like home supporting the MSPs in the, in the various functions that they have um, within parliament. In terms of my job specifically, I manage Andy's diary, um, casework, correspondence, all those sorts of things, making sure he has his, his briefings for, for what he needs and quite often chasing some or all of them off to where they should be at, at specific times. Obviously, that's slightly more difficult from 30 miles along the road. Um, Day to day, a lot of our a lot of our work is structured around parliamentary business. Um, most of our MSPs sit on two committees within Parliament, two subject committees. Um, Andy sits on both economy committee and local government committee. He's also on the corporate body, so that means some weeks we don't have him in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday morning. And then there's obviously chamber business in the afternoon on a normal week. Um, quite often Andy's portfolios aren't involved in that. Alison with her health portfolio is usually quite heavily involved in that. Um, so there's there's a lot of preparing them for for the work through the week. Most of the MSPs will have um, some form of parliamentary assistant or office manager and a researcher within the within the team. The researcher usually is doing various projects and things. If um, to take examples from our office, it would be things like um, Homes First. We've, our Homes First campaign, we've done lots of work on short-term lets and the issues that they cause within Edinburgh and through the rest of the country as well. We've had lots of contacts with people from um, Sky and various bits of Fife where there's they have big issues with um, short-term lets as well. They also... Um, Charlotte, who's Andy's researcher, Charlotte's been dealing with Andy's members bill, which was signed today. So that's really starting to, to gather some momentum and hopefully that'll get underway soon. Um, Charlotte prepares briefings for him, um, helps with uh, 
preparation for committee and things like that as well. Their committee papers are massive. Quite often Andy will get committee papers on a Thursday for um for his committees on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. These can be anything up to a hundred pages per committee to read in to read, digest, understand and then be able to ask questions of the witnesses in four days and that includes two weekend days is now an impossible without without another brain to help. Um on a normal week within Parliament, a lot of this is done by sitting down, pre a lot of preparation and a lot of the communication we have with MSPs and across all six offices um, is done in person. It's done by going and grabbing someone, sitting down and saying, can we have 10 minutes to talk about this bit of work that overlaps or that bit of work that overlaps? That's slightly more difficult when we're all spread, when we're as far away as Inverness to to Edinburgh out to Mulgai in the West and all all those sorts of places. Um, Slack has been a major help. I'm not always the biggest fan of Slack, <laughs> um, but Slack's been a, a huge help in keeping keeping the team going. We do have a, a WhatsApp chat as well for all the staff where it's just generally memes, uh, emoji quizzes courtesy of Kev and, and various other bits of bits of chat going on um, the the week has changed somewhat with with lockdown um, what you would usually get up and walk around the corner of your desk and into the MSP's office and say what are we doing about X, Y and Z either needs a phone call or a text or a phone call text and email and because these, thing, these things are so easily missed with the hunt when MSPs say they receive hundreds of emails a day, that's not a lie. If you leave Andy's inbox alone for a week, there's you could easily have a thousand. If you didn't touch it at all, you could easily have a thousand plus emails in there. Um, so a request for what we're doing about this can often disappear into the ether a little bit. So there's, it seems a lot more intense to get small things done at the moment and that's no fault of that's no fault of anyone's it's just technology is sometimes a bit more of a hindrance than a help with things that you really need a human for um i am very much missing the rest of the team and you can't have birthday cake remotely unfortunately we're <laughs> it's it's really we have a really good team and it's it's nice that we all take to on a normal week we all take time and sit down and chat and we all get up and go for lunch at the same time and and things like that and there's we've had a few myself and a couple of the others have had a few um breakfast skype meetings and and things like that just for a chat and rubbish chat they're having some of them have a wee quiz on a thursday afternoon and stuff but it's just not the same as all 30 of us being in been in a corridor on a Tuesday and a Wednesday together. So it's, yeah, I decry them sometimes, but I do miss them all. <laughs> so it, it, when when the coronavirus first crisis first broke, um, I know you and the other parliamentary staff were, I mean, the MSPs were run off their feet. You guys were run off your feet. You were quite stressed. I think there was some quite distressing information coming across your desks and some quite urgent legislation that had to be dealt with. What was that like? It's nothing like I've ever dealt with. Um, we obviously had the emergency legislation with the um, continuity bill earlier in the session. And so we know how intense emergency legislation can be. That was very much a constitutional thing. So it was almost a bit less emotionally intense than this has been. We had so many emails about we've had so many emails about people not having PPE people not having money being people who were stuck between because of where the the restrictions on furlough came in we had so many um with so many people saying that I've I've basically fallen between the gaps that they were um that they changed jobs in that period where they weren't either going to they weren't going to be covered by furlough by their new job and may have to go back to their old employer and say look I was working for you here can you furlough me 
that's an awful situation to be in, particularly depending on the reasons you've you've left your job. There's loads of people whose whose businesses are in are in jeopardy, and people's people who were genuinely fearful for their health as well. People who felt they were vulnerable and weren't at that point receiving the support that they needed. Um, I think for the whole staff team, it was it was really intense with the sheer number of emails we were receiving. We, I, the first sort of week, week and a half of lockdown, I, did, I don't think I did anything other than help answer constituent emails. And yeah, I think we did a, I think we did a tally of emails at some point and there was a, there was a couple of hundred in the space of, space of a week and a half. Um, and it was just nine to five constantly answering answering people's requests and a lot of the time we didn't have the answers because things were moving and things are still moving so quickly we're essentially trying to understand a virus in in the length of in a shorter length of time than we ever have tried to if you look at the length of time we've been studying flu and the network and stuff we've got set up for that and how many people still have flu in a year that we're trying to do that level of research in a much smaller time so every time we were sending an email we were almost being overtaken by the next thing happening um so the the sort of repeat contact with constituents as well was quite was quite overwhelming compared with compared with other things that that we've done as well thankfully a lot of that has now settled and a lot of what we are now starting to look at is how we come back to some shape or form of normality and what that new normal is um that's going to take a lot of work from from the msps from the staff team from from our councillors as well because our councillors have had a massive massive workload as well and they've been they've been dealing with a lot of very geographically specific on the ground things um so that's that's sort of the next stages is how do we start to move back to something that resembles some form of normality? I think it's um, been recognised in the press and such that the Green MSPs and obviously supported by the staff have done a really good job of holding the government to account of Make, of cooperating and making sure the legislation is good legislation of contributing but but equally yeah as i say holding the government to account on their performance because there's a there's this sort of idea in the press that the you know the tories don't want to hold the snp government to account because it'll show up their shortcomings at the uk level and the snp don't want to hold the tories too hard to account because it'll show up their uh, shortcomings at the scottish government level and, and, and i think nobody's expecting a perfect performance but we do expect our governments to be accountable, to be transparent with their decision making. And I think the Scottish Green MSPs, as I say, and the staff have done a really effective job of, of doing that. Absolutely. It's the, I think it's the tact we've tried to take. You have to be, especially at a time like this, during a pandemic, during a time where public feeling is, the general public feeling is is that of being concerned and being anxious that constructive opposition is is absolutely the way forward you have to be critical you have to ask the questions of their decisions but you have to do that in a way that recognizes that they are in an extremely difficult position and that they are going to make mistakes as as i said this is an unknown virus and research takes time research is ultimately going to eventually make out that some of these decisions may have been wrong but they have to be taken at face value at the time they were made with the information that they had and i think that's very much the position that that the msps are coming from that criticize not even critic it's not criticizing it is constructive opposition and constructive inquiry about how these decisions were made what the next decisions should be and how we should be going forward from there and if you present what you think should be the next steps and i think that's where where we'll be heading is this is 
what we think a new normal should be and if you take your it's the same with the budget and things like that if you take your thoughts and your input and you say these are the things we want these are the things we think then people start to to say oh well we like we like these bits we don't like those bits where can where can we find some form of some form of compromise and it is that is constructive opposition the pointing fingers the shouting the the you're rubbish no you're rubbish is not an effective way to either govern or be in opposition you have to there is give and take in every other workplace in the country so why why should we expect any less of our elected representatives really I think you've captured that and described that really well. It's something that I remember many years ago, Alison Johnson at a women's network meeting was talking to us about standing for Hollywood. La that was last time around. Yeah. And, she, you know, every a lot of, in particular, women are put off by the hideous chamber of Westminster with the sort of yeah. shouting and catcalling and animal noises, particularly when women stand up to speak. And because there's a feeling in Westminster that you get the red team and the blue team and they alternate. And the first thing they do when they get into power is undo everything the previous team did. And there's no chance of collaboration or cooperation or any sort of negotiation. It's win or lose, have power or don't have power. And the first thing that Alison Johnson said to us was, that is not what Hollywood is like because it's a proportional parliament, because one vote you'll be voting, you know, you'll need the support of that party, red party, yellow party, another vote you'll need the support of a different party. You don't just, you don't fall out with people. You don't shout at anybody. You have to maintain a much more mature, a much more professional demeanor. You have to be open to negotiation with people from any party on any particular issue. Mm -hmm. You can't just draw party lines and say, well, you know, that's it because constructive opposition, which is something the Greens are really committed to, making step-by-step -step progress towards our goals and making sure that legislation that gets through is as good as it can be, as effective as it can be, mm -hmm. and not just putting our foot down because it was put forward by a party we didn't like, is, is a really different way of working. Absolutely, and you, I think you see, you see a lot of that in the chamber and a lot of the stage, in a lot of the stage three legislation. But actually, a lot of the groundwork that's done for the stage three legislation is actually done in committees, which is maybe the thing that people don't tune into as much. There's a lot of work behind the scenes that goes on at stage two to to find amendments that are going to do what we want to do, but that are palatable to other parties for them to be able to support it. There's the planning bill was one that took so much toing and froing. There were so many amendments to it, and I'm so glad that's done. Um, but there's such there's a disappointment, various... though, to get that it got stitched up by the Tories and the SNP, and not, but, none of the really effective reforms got through. But that that happens if you're going if mm. if we're going to be constructive, we have to we sometimes have to show our hand. Um, if you know you can get away with one party um, supporting you, for for example, if there was a um, if there was a, an amendment between that we were putting forward that we would know the government would support, you don't really have to show your hand to anybody else to say this is what we're bringing forward. Obviously, once you lodge the amendment, it's in it's in the public domain; anybody can see it. But when you are relying on the support of the other parties, you sort of have to go and, or you don't know where your support's going to come from. You have to go to everyone and say this is what we're thinking. And sometimes you you get gazumped. And that's sometimes just how it goes. Um, it's not quite the case of tough luck, but it's the it's the case of sit on it, bring it back, get more of us elected the next time, get more of us in there and bring it back next time round, get it enacted and and go from there. And that's that's the way you have to look at it. Otherwise, you'll be trodden down by every single little defeat that we have. We've made a lot of massive steps forward this session. We're going to continue doing that. And next session, we're going to bring back more of us and have more of a say and do more good things.
And uh, on that note then, so you are going to be one of our new MSPs next time around as our lead candidate <laughs> in Central Scotland. So we are polling to get a, an MSP in every region and that would be you for Central Scotland. Can you tell me some of your ideas of things that are important to you, would be important to you as an MSP in Central Scotland and what you'd be working for specifically? So a lot of the things... Um, in Central Scotland will be similar to other places in the country really. Um, transport is a major one. Trans thinking transport right now, it's a lot of what we're talking about with this coming out of out of lockdown and things. Um obviously I work for a Lothian MSP. They're talking about how how many people in, in Lothian use public transport to get around Edinburgh and things like that. Through here Public transport isn't probably used as well as it could be, but it's very expensive. It's not particularly reliable. Um, we have very old buses. Our bus station was shut in the last couple of years. The buses now sit idle just down from, from the high street in Falkirk. There's no connectivity across the across the region at all. Most places it's easier to go um, into, into Glasgow and back out from different points in the region there's no there's no easy public transport way to get from to get from Falkirk to East Kilbride on the other side you end up having to go via Glasgow and the same between between South Lanarkshire and North Lanarkshire even getting between between different bits of North Lanarkshire there's there's real difficulties um and for um jobs and uh, from the Green New Deal paper and things there's there's lots of opportunities to to transform some of the the areas that have had the heaviest industry historically um, if you look at uh, bits around around Ravenscraig here in Grangemouth um, there's bits of East Kilbride that've got very heavy industry in it as well lots of those areas are are prime targets for changing to green industries that are going to protect jobs for the future we can't rely on on fossil fuels and heavy petrochemical industries and and all those sorts of things to to make jobs safe for the future we've seen how low oil prices have crashed when when no one's out using their cars that's going to take a while to recover is it going to cost jobs possibly so this is a perfect time to start transitioning towards um, industries that are going to guarantee well-paid jobs, jobs with good terms and conditions for the future and that is nowhere more applicable than than right across right across central Scotland. There's lots of there's lots of um, lots of our social policies healthy wealthy children all those sorts of things that are going to make huge differences to big bits of central Scotland. We've just hopefully got to be able to get out there and speak to people and but there's a lot of plans that have to adapt to um to what the new normal might be and how long social distancing might go on and whether we actually have an election in May 2021 or not um but those are all very much wait and sees and there are there are plans afoot to try and start start speaking to people and start hearing people's concerns because that is a major component of this campaign is listening to what the people of Falkirk, North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire actually want to see next session. What they what changes they want to see and all the things that we can we can deliver on as a party and so that's that's where we're we're sitting at the moment and watch this space for things uh, things coming forward so uh, one of the reasons why i'm so excited about getting you elected to the scottish parliament in particular is because you are a young woman and one of the problems that we talk about all the time in politics is the lack of diversity how rich white middle-aged men are wildly overrepresented and almost nobody else ever gets a look in so as a young disabled woman um you tick quite a lot of those boxes, you as a person represent, you know, a, a div diversity and a different way of thinking. Do you have some ideas that you'd like to share with us about why it is so very important to get more young people into Scottish Parliament and into politics in general? I think the diversity thing is, is key. I think we've seen a lot this session, 
obviously we got um we got Ross in 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 twenty sixteen and still we see so often Ross getting comments on Twitter and things like that saying, Oh, come back when you've got some life experience. That's just so much rubbish. Um young people are the ones that know what will support other young people. They know what they've just come through school or through university or have just bought their first house, moved into their first flat, need that sort of support. And if you don't have those voices in parliament or in council or wherever within elected structures, how do you know what these young people need? How do you know what their experience is? How do you make legislation that is that is representative? It's like if you don't have disabled people in elected politics, how how do you see their perspective? How do you have their perspective represent, represented? Yes, many of the MSPs will, will represent disabled constituents when they have a problem, but they don't have that lived experience of facing these problems themselves. Um it's it's very much like I I watch some of the some of the Westminster briefings at the moment and you don't you don't hear voices that represent you and if there are there are undoubtedly people in Scotland who sit and watch some of the exchanges in the chamber and don't see a disabled person, a young woman, someone from who is trans, someone from an LGBT background. And the more diversity there is in a chamber, the better the legislation is going to be ultimately because you have the widest range of views, experience and general world outlook that is going to make legislation as applicable to as many people as possible and as supportive of as many people as possible. It's a lot of the problem we have with um, a lot of the benefits stuff being reserved to Westminster. Scottish, we are, the Scottish Parliament is, um, is responsible for health and social care, so they know who, um, who is vulnerable and who needs that extra support, but yet we're not responsible for the benefits and things that will then support those people is reserved elsewhere. It we can we can make a lot of difference with legislation by bringing those with experience and with different viewpoints, different uh, different barriers that they've overcome into into parliament, into these structures to make a difference and make legislation as diverse as possible. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Gillian, for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. I hope, I hope the, the green washes out to a colour that you're happy with. It will. It'll be fine. It'll but go I back still to think blonde. it looks fantastic. 